are Vikings. We pillage, raid, hunt, exploring, and we fade Odin. Now we have the Norwegians who can do business with us. Do you want to know how to play a Fist for Odin, the Norwegians expansion? In this video, we're going to take you through the full rules for this expansion, highlighting the differences between this and the base game. If you don't know how to play a Feast for Odin the base game, we have a how to play video for that, which you should check out first before continuing with this. Otherwise, keep watching till the end and we hope you can pick up some tips and strategies along the way. Coming up. Hi, Stella. And Tarrant from Meeple University. We bring you a variety of quality board game videos. So if you're new here, please consider subscribing to us and hit the bell button to be notified of our new videos. Now, let's get to the rules for A Feast for Odin, the Norwegian's expansion. Game by Uwe Rosenberg and Gernot Köpke and published by Z-Man Games. The Norwegian's is not so much an expansion to A Feast for Odin as it is Feast for Odin version 2.0. It's the same basic game, but it comes with a series of new components which through some slight upgrades, completely replace the original parts of the game. To start with, you'll dispense with the original board and extra tiles from the base game, and use the new three-part action board from the Norwegian's expansion. This board will scale for your player count. In the bottom corner of each board, it will tell you which side to use for your player count. In this way, each of the three sections of the board will scale a little differently depending on your player count. There are some new types of goods that come with the game, including two new types of animals, pigs and horses. These are used in addition to all of the goods from the base game. There are six new special goods tiles in Norwegians. Place any tiles with both a forge symbol and a sword value of 8 or less onto the new smaller oval board, and place the rest onto the back side of the larger oval from the base game. There is a new shipping board which replaces the board from the original game and provides space for the new small immigration tiles. The expansion comes with eight exploration tiles and these replace the four from the base game. In fact, there is a new copy of each of the tiles from the base game with the slightly new iconography that comes with the expansion. When setting up for the expansion, you will use four tiles, an A, a B, a C, and a D, in the two-player game. In the three-player game, you'll add either another A and B, or another C and D. And in the four-player game, you'll use all eight. This way, the number of exploration tiles available in the expansion will scale with the number of players. There is one new mountain strip, which, even though it's a different size to those in the base game, you will shuffle in with the others. And finally, to start the game, each player is dealt a random, double-sided, artisan shared card. I'll explain how these work as we go through the rules. So now, we'll go into the rule changes and new actions. Firstly, you'll see that there are now five columns on the board. The first four work the same way that they did in the base game. The fifth is quite a bit different. In the fifth column, you have the option of playing one Viking, or playing two Vikings, and being allowed to play an Occupation card as a bonus effect. However, whenever you take an action from the fifth column, it must be your final action for this actions phase. Even if you have Vikings remaining, you must pass on your next turn. All of the Build Houses actions are the same as they are in the base game, but they now use the icon of the type of house itself, rather than a picture of the board. Additionally, taking one of the Build Shed actions allows the player to build one of the Artisan Sheds that was dealt to the player at the start of the game. A player places the Artisan Shed either side up, next to the player board, and may then fill it in the same way as in the base game. The exception is that some of these contain spaces that can only be filled by a certain type of goods. The other placement rules are the same as for the Sheds and Houses in the base game. Hunting options in the expansion have increased slightly. Now you'll use a D8, Snares and Spears, to catch fish, and you can use a D8, Snares, Spears and Bows, to catch Elk. 
As for other types of hunting, your compensation should you fail is equal to one of each of the weapon types that you could have spent to succeed. With the two new animals in the game, the livestock market now gives you some more variety of how to purchase your animals. Three silver for wheat and one animal, two silver and some beans for either two sheep, two pigs or one of each, or three silver and a wheat for two animals. Unlike the base game, you also now have options for slaughtering your animals for meat and skin. Your player board does not have a designated stable area for the two new animal types, but this doesn't mean that you can't still pair them and breed them as you would in the base game. A pair of horses will produce an offspring every second round, just like sheep and cattle, while pigs breed more quickly, and so a pair of pigs will produce a new offspring every round. There is no pregnant side for the pig tile. Horses produce a lot more victory points than any of the other species of animals, but as we'll see shortly, they don't produce very many other goods, only making a little bit of wheat, and this offsets their high victory point value. Pigs, because they breed more quickly, are worth only one point each. The weekly market and product sections of the board, which were two separate rows in the base game, have been accumulated into one big row. Now the players can get some sort of bonus for free and some sort of bonus for their animals. This means that if you time your actions correctly, you can get more bonus from breeding animals in this game than you could in the base. The crafting actions have not changed significantly with the exception of the new final action. Here you can spend one ore to forge an item which has a sword value less than nine. And these are the ones that you would have separated onto the smaller oval board at the start of the game. The Mountains and Trades section has all icons that you'll recognise from the base game. There are a few changes to some of the numbers, but nothing significantly new. The Knar actions here in the Sailing section are also familiar from the base game. Raiding, Pillaging and Plundering are unchanged from the base game, but there's the introduction of a new fifth column action called Theft. Theft is more sneaky than these actions, and so the prerequisite is one of your merchant Knar ships, not a longship. And this now provides a way for players who don't have longships to go and try to get some plunder. To take the theft action, the player rolls the d8 up to three times, attempting to roll high. The battle score may be increased by discarding swords, bows, or spears. If successful, as for pillaging and raiding, the player takes a blue or special tile with a sword value equal or lower than the final battle score. If unsuccessful, the player gains one of each of these three weapons as compensation. The exploration action is fundamentally unchanged, but the iconography has changed. To place your meeples in a column, you must have the type of ship shown in that space. Then, to take the exploration board, you must not only have the matching type of ship, but also have placed your meeples in the matching column. As such, you could go to Bear Island with a Knar, but not by placing in the first column. In the fourth column, you can take any of the exploration tiles out there, but you need to have a longship, even if that tile usually only requires a Knar or a whaling boat. There is a new type of emigration called a small emigration in this expansion, and this allows you to emigrate with a whaling boat. To do this, you will discard the whaling boat as well as any ore placed on it and then take one of these small emigration tiles. This covers up one feast slot instead of two and is worth seven points. Four points more than your whaling boat. Finally, there are some new actions around occupations. Here, you can discard one unplayed occupation card to either gain two silver or to draw three new occupation cards. And here, you can draw two new occupation cards into your hand, then play one from your hand and gain a silver. The other actions are unchanged from the base game. One feature of the game of Feast for Odin is that you can try to play occupation cards solely for their points, even if you have no interest in using the bonus effect. But this introduced a random element where a player's fortunes would swing on whether the player's occupation cards actually earn points. In the Norwegian's expansion, this is modified. 
any time a player takes an action to play an occupation card in the Norwegian's expansion, instead of actually playing the card, the player may discard it and then take the highest remaining victory point token from these stacks. There are two four point tokens, six three point tokens, and effectively an unlimited number of two point tokens. In this way, players who are playing these cards just for points can mitigate some of the random element. You can count these victory points as part of occupations on the final score pad. Finally, on the back page of your Norwegian's rulebook, there is some information about how to interpret the occupation cards given the new goods in the game. Occupations relating to animals will generally also relate to horses and pigs, and the new artisan sheds count as sheds but not houses. Due to changes in action spaces, there are also some cards which can no longer be used. And that's how to play a Feast for Odin the Norwegian expansion. We hope that you enjoy the video and we hope that you enjoy playing. As we mentioned earlier, if you'd like to learn to play the base version of a Feast for Odin, we have a how to play video for that and you can check that out via the link in the description below. If you enjoyed this video, please let us know by hitting the like button. Put your questions or feedback in the comment sections below. You can also join our Facebook group, Mipple University Community, to share your love of board games. And finally, if you'd like to be among the first ones notified of what's new from us, please consider subscribing to our channel. You can click on the meeple up in the corner to do so, and do hit the bell to be notified of our new videos. Until next time!